You'll notice at the top, what and how do you hear? And if you've got a pen, I want you to underline the word you, because this is an emphasis on each and every one of us here. This is not a class on teaching you how to hear or how we're supposed to hear. This is a lesson here about how we hear the word of God and what we think and how we feel whenever the word of God comes our way. What and how do you hear? Praise the Lord. And we're going to go with the scriptures on that. If you would look at the verses of scripture that we've got, we've got uh, reference to faith. And if you look at Luke 8, 18 with us, we'll start there and then we'll go to one in Mark. And I want to talk to you from my heart here today some about <clears throat> our walk with God. And if you look at uh, St. Luke chapter 8 and verse 18, these are the words that the Lord is saying here to his disciples after having talked to them about the sower. Now, last week we talked about the sower went forth to sow. We compared the last two grounds. Four grounds were involved. We talked about the last two grounds. And one was good ground and one was a, a thorny ground. And uh, that's not our subject today, but this is that same parable. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all give this parable in their gospels. Now, this is uh, what Luke says here in reference to what has been said about it. He says in verse 18, <clears throat> take heed therefore how you hear. Everybody see the word how? If you have your Bibles, underline the word how. And he says, take heed therefore how ye hear. Now I hear a little roar. Is, is that okay? Everything all right? All right. Take heed therefore how you hear, for whatsoever, whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. If you've got your Bibles, write in the margin there, faith, faith. And this is talking about faith, praise the Lord. So he says here, take heed therefore how you hear, for what's, whosoever hath, in other words, if you have faith, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, if you do not have faith, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. And everything. Now, I want to go to Mark, if you'll notice, that's our second verse of scripture in that reference there. In Mark uh, 4 and 24, this is Mark's rendering of the same thing, but it gives us a different view of it here. This is the 24th verse that I'm looking at, verses 24 and 25. And this is what, how Mark records this. And he said unto them, take heed what you hear. Now notice here that Luke says, take hear, hear how you hear. But Mark says, take heed what you hear. What you hear. And both are important. When we hear the word of God and we hear anything we have to take note of what we're hearing, what we're listening to, and we have to, we have to determine how we are hearing it and what we are hearing. Praise the Lord. Let me read on down here, and I want to talk to you a minute about that. He said unto them, take heed what you hear, with what measure ye met, it shall be measured to you, and unto you that hear shall more be given. <clears throat> Verse 25 for he that hath to him shall be given. He that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath. Again, write in the margin of your Bible there, if you've got your pen and your Bible with you, faith. It's talking about faith. So take heed not only how you hear, but take heed to what you hear. Praise the Lord. And this is what the Lord is telling his disciples here at this point. And I'm going to just say this today, folks. Be careful what you hear, what you hear. I'm going to put a little emphasis on that. There's so much garbage out there, so much junk out there. You can spend your days all day long and you can spend all week long listening to garbage stuff. You know, you can glue yourself to TVs. You can try to, you can look at movies. You can look at all of this stuff going on in the world. 
And all of it will eventually have an effect on you. So the Lord says, be careful what you hear. Don't lend your ear to everything that's going on and everything being said. Praise the Lord. Because there's a lot of stuff that's not worth your time. It's not worth your attention. It's not worth even listening to. Praise the Lord. So be careful what you hear. There's all kinds of junk and mess. And, and so I want to put that emphasis because Mark emphasizes be careful what you hear. And then I'm going to go back here and talk to you how we hear what we hear. Praise the Lord. But be careful what you lend yourself to listen to and all the stuff out there that comes our way until you start listening to everything in the world and everything in the world becomes depressing and, and discouraging. And the next thing you know, you'd wonder, is, 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 is truth really truth? Is the Lord's word really truth? Is it really going to be the way it is? And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that a little further on. But I'm just trying to say here today, be careful what you hear. Praise the Lord. The Bible teaches us that. <clears throat> now I'm going to go back to Luke here. I was in Luke to start with. And I want to go back to Luke here, chapter 4. And, uh, and I want you to look at these verses here of Scripture. And I'm going to go to Luke uh, 9. This is, I mean, uh, Luke... Uh, I'm going to go to Luke here. Understanding the parable of the sower. Go to Luke 9 and 11. 9 and 11. We're in 8 there. Just go to Luke 9. I'm going to go. I'm going to have you look at Luke uh, 8, 11. 9 is not the right chapter. I'm sorry. This is an error. It's Luke 8, 11. 8, 11. So if you've got it in your, in your paper there, change that 9 to an 8. That's an 8. That's back to the same chapter we were just in. Now, verse 11, look at this very closely with us. Thank you folks for keeping up with me there. They have a hard time sometimes. Hey, thank you. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Now we talked about how the sore went forth to sow. Some fell on, uh, on, the, on the wayside, some fell on rocky ground and some fell among thorns and so forth. Now here's what he's given the answer to that according to Luke here. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear and then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy and these have no root which for a while believe and in time temptation they fall away. So when they hear the word of God, it never sticks with them. Some people hear the word and they're just out and gone again. We talked about that just for briefly last week. And this is telling us a little bit what precedes all of that. Because there's no faith is, is how we hear the word of the Lord. And I'm going to talk to you about that because when we hear the word of God, we've got to hear it with faith. Lord, I believe your word. Because there's a lot of stuff out there. I remember as a young man, uh, I'm just going to take time to talk to you about this. When I was a young man, and my wife and I were young evangelists. We were traveling around preaching here and there. There was a, a woman that was an anthropologist, a scientist, an anthropologist, going to college. I don't know what university she attended. She had a professor that told her, the class this and told her specifically this. He said that if there was no teaching of right and wrong, people would be happier. Now listen to this. You know, right and wrong is what comes out of the word of God, right? If there was no teaching of right and wrong, people would be happier because the feeling of guilt, the feeling of unhappiness, the feeling of misery, is because we feel like we've done something wrong and therefore it hangs over our head. But if there was no teaching of right and wrong, we would be happy. And he says that if somebody could, you know, find out and experiment with that, they would find that was the truth. So this woman, she decided to go to the Samoan Islands. This has been, a, this is about a hundred years ago. She decided to go to the Samoan Islands and live among the people that no missionary had ever been to. No Christianity had ever been that way. 
and it was just raw natives that was living in that land. And she would go there and she'd live among the people and see how it worked. She went there and she spent a few years and then she came back and she announced, oh, that professor was right. If you're not taught right and wrong, then everything's okay. They, they, they don't get married on the island. They just sweep around. Everybody's happy. Everybody just goes their way. They have a good, everything's a party. They just live happy on the beaches. And she came back and she traveled. Listen, folks, she traveled around all over universities. I was in Minnesota when she went to the University of Minnesota and lectured to the young people there that if you do not believe in right and wrong and you're not hamstrung with right and wrong and just do whatever you want to do, you're happier. I was also, I was in Lafayette, Indiana and in West Lafayette, Indiana, across the river there, uh, it was it's Purdue University. My wife worked at Purdue at the time for a short time when we were up in that part of the, up in, part, in the Midwest. She worked at Purdue and this woman came there and she lectured the same thing. She's going around all these universities telling the young people, if you just sleep around and if you don't like each other, you part, you split up after about three or four years or two years or five years or whatever you want to and you go your way and you do everything. And folks, she began to sow that discard all over America. And it brought a whole generation of Americans into this thing. And I'm thinking, you don't have to get married, just start living together. And that, that whole thing keeps carried on today. An anthropologist, whenever she got older in years, an anthropologist from England decided to follow up in the Samoan Islands and find out exactly if that was all true and so forth because what he was seeing, it wasn't that way. He went to the Samoan Islands and he spent three years there studying that. He came back and he said, she lied. Boy, he was bold about it. She's an anthropologist. I'm an anthropologist. But I want you to know when she came back from the Samoan Islands, she lied about it. She didn't tell the truth. They have high suicide rates there. They have high crime. They have violence among. They fight among themselves. They are very much into each other because there is no teachings of what's right and wrong and standards. And, and you can't and don't commit a fornication and don't commit adultery. But choose a wife if you're a man and choose a, a husband if you're a woman and, and all these kind of things and he said she lied about it now what if i had been listening to her it would in other words what if i had been be careful what you hear in other words, what do you what are you are you hearing so the bible says in that one place how you hear and it says what you hear so don't lend your ear to everything. Oh, there's a new thing. There's a new thought. There's a new idea. I, uh, I heard this philosophy came out of, the, of, this, uh, of this scientist. Uh, I don't know what doctorate or what kind of degree he had, but uh, he was studying, trying to find out about the link of man between the, uh, the ape and the human being. They believed in evolution. And uh, he said they was trying to find it. They went over here in, to Central Africa. And they went to a little place by a creek there. And they found carved in, in the stone there in the, in the, in the, down in the, in the mud and stuff. They found it petrified where there was a footprint and a toe. And the toe was pointed out. And they said, oh, these are human footprints, but the toe is out, which means that this, and it was a woman's foot and a man was just ahead of her, so by the footprints. And that means that the toe, she was part ape. She wasn't all just a human, she was in between. And he came back and said that the evolution process of, in humanity began in Central Africa. And they made it all over a big story and they made a big issue of wrote books on it and began to teach it in universities. I was there, I've been right there. I went to that very place. And uh, I remember going there and my son was with me. We were there looking at this, we walked there. And there's a big picture of these people that look like half monkeys and half people. And here they are walking and you know, and it shows her foot and she's flipping a little mud. 
And there's the spot carved in stone, not carved, but just imprinted in the stone is where it's supposed to have been preserved for thousands of years. And there, there's supposed to be and everything. And I looked at that and I said, you mean that's his evidence right there? Is that all the evidence he's got to say that man came from monkey, from an ape? That's, that was his proof. That was what he was proving it. And my son said to me, Dad, why do you think that he locked onto that and insisted that that's what it all represented? I said, because he spent years here studying all that stuff and he felt like that he had to go back and give the report of what he believed, not what was truth. Do you understand what I say? Be careful what you hear. And there's all kinds of stuff on evolution and all kinds of story on out here and out there, folks. Stay with the book. Stay with the book. Praise the Lord. The book will never fail us. It'll never fail us. Amen. Let me go a little further in this. Praise God. Now, notice here, this is an everlasting uh, parable of the uh, sower. And I talked to you about this. It'd be Luke uh, 8 there, not Luke 9. Uh, look at Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 with me. Praise the Lord. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we need to be in church. God bless all of you people for being in the house of God. Praise the Lord. I don't know if I'm worth listening to here today, but you got me on your hands, whatever. But I'm just saying that this is how we hear the word of God by coming to the house of God. It's an easy thing to let it slip. It's an easy thing to let it slide and say, well, I've got other things to do or something more important or uh, this has come up or that's come up. Oh, push them aside so that I'm going to the house of God and I'm going to worship the Lord. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And there's been a few times I have gone to church when I was lower than a gnat's heel. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I just felt so down and I was just so discouraged. And I've gone to the house of God and the spirit of God would move and I would pick up my hands and lift them up to, the, to heaven and worship God and begin to feel the presence and the spirit of God. And it wasn't long, I was on my feet and I was worshiping the Lord, jumping up and down, dancing in the Lord because the spirit of the Lord was upon me because I heard the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we got to keep in touch with the word that faith might stay in our hearts and that when we hear that other stuff, it may, it's not going to affect how we hear it. We'll say that's garbage, but I stay with the book and I stay with the word. Praise God. Now, let me move on here. Examples of men of faith. I want to talk to you about David for a moment. And I want you to go to 1 Samuel 17 here. This is, of course, old hat with us, but I want you to look at this very closely here. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you something about David. There's two understandings that I came about David that, that I, I think the Lord just opened my understanding to it. They weren't at the same time. They were years apart. One of them was to understand why David picked up five stones. And I've talked to you and I've preached and I've talked to it and other, other preachers have barred the message and they preach it all over and that's fine, that's God's word. Why did David pick up five stones? Because he was committed to the battle. He didn't know if one stone to do it, two stones to do it, three stones, he didn't know. But he was there to fight the battle, whatever it took, commitment. Now, the other thing that I wanna point out to you here to David is what I'm gonna to talk to you right now. Look at this. Look at verse 20. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper. I'm in, uh, I'm in Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. Left the sheep with a keeper and took and went. And as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the, the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. Oh, he was excited about it. Look at verse 23. I'm saving time by skipping down here because there's a lot here to cover and I'm not going to read everything. As he talked with them, behold, there came up 
the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. Out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according the same words and David heard them. Now listen to me closely here. David heard what he said. Take heed how you hear. You understand what I'm saying now? I'm going to show you here how it affected David what he heard. Goliath came out, he challenged and said, send me a man to fight me a man. If he kills me, then I will be your, uh, we'll, be your uh, we'll, we'll submit to you. And then if I kill him, you submit to us. And David heard them. And look at verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. That's how, that's how they heard the word uh, from Goliath. And then uh, I'm going to jump on down here to verse 32, because what happened here that David said, you know, what's this man carried on here? It, nobody's going to fight him. And he says, I'll fight the man. And the, his brother says, hey, David, get on back to your sheep. What are you doing out here? You don't belong out here. So finally in verse 32, and David said to Saul, Saul was the king then. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, what I've done here is, is skipped a lot of other things in the story here. But what I'm pointing out to you here is when David heard everybody fled but David. And he wasn't a warrior. He was a shepherd boy. And he heard it. And he said, no. No. I'll fight him. How did David hear what the giant said different than what the others said? He said it with faith in the word of God. He had faith in the word of God when he heard what the giant was saying. Let me show you. I want to go back here over to the scriptures of Deuteronomy. I mean, uh, yeah, Deuteronomy. And this is uh, where I want you to have. Go look at Deuteronomy. He answered because of his faith in the word of God. Look at Deuteronomy 31, 6. <clears throat> this is whenever the Lord was, uh, this is whenever uh, Moses was leaving the children of Israel, going to go up in the mountains and would be taken away, going to die. And the Bible said the angels buried him and so forth. And he knew he was going and he told the children of Israel. Pretty soon you're going to be going into Canaan's land. Here's what he says. Be strong, six, be strong and of, of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. Who is them? Them were the, were the inhabitants of the land of Canaan that they had to go out and go in and fight. Don't be afraid. And the Lord told Moses and Moses was telling the children of Israel. And he said, and don't be afraid of them for the Lord thy God. He is, it, it is that goeth with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. It's in the word. It's in the word. Praise the Lord. Verse eight. And the Lord, he, it is that goeth before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be a dismay. This is what Moses told the children of Israel. And just three pages later, in the very first chapter <clears throat> of Joshua, when Joshua had taken over the army, the Lord appeared unto Joshua. And this is what he says in verse, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5 here of Joshua, 1 and 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Notice that. Then God's giving Joshua the, the assurance. Going to verse 9 here, just to save time. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, neither uh, whithersoever thou goest. Now... The Lord told the children of Israel, he said, now go into the land and conquer the land. Go into the land and conquer the land. I've given it into your hands. They went in, they fought, they conquered, they conquered, they conquered, and then they quit. And then they started making friends with the people. And the Lord said, don't do that because they're heathen. They worship idols. They worship false gods. They are wicked. 
there's many things about them that I want them out of the land and you have to go in as a pure people that I have chosen to come in and possess the land. And so he told them to do that. And after a while, they quit fighting and they, made, they got along with those people. They never drove them out. Let me say one word here. When we come to the Lord, God brings us out of the world. That's like God bringing Israel out of Egypt. He brings us through. He brings us into the, into the church, into the promised land. Are you hanging on to some things, folks? Is there something in your life that you need to lay down and quit? Are you, hold, are you letting some enemies stay in your life? Just like they allowed those heathens to stay in their, their land. And they, they were supposed to be driven out. The Hivites, the Malachites, the, the, uh, the, all the kites that was all through Palestine. And they never drove them out. They just worked in harmony. And in time, they would overthrow Israel. And Israel had to fight back them. And they went around, 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 around. And this is what went on that way because they never got rid of those heathens when God said, I'm going to go with you and I'll give you the victory. God's word said that. I won't leave you, I won't forsake you, and I'll give you conquest over them. And they allowed them to stay in the land. Sometimes people get saved and they say, oh, I can't give up my drug. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, because God's word says, the Lord said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and I'll give you the power to do that. Oh, I can't give up, uh, I can't give up smoking. Oh, yes, you can. I can't give up some kind of drugs. I can't give up uh, whatever, porno. Some guys are into that stuff, I guess. They, maybe they were, I don't know, whatever. Whatever you were ever into. I can't give up going to the bars on a Saturday night and sitting there and drinking beer and talking to my friend. I can't give it up. Oh, come on. Praise the Lord. Give that stuff up. Amen. Leave it all behind. Drive it out of your life. Just like they had to drive out those heathens out of Canaan's land. Drive it out of your life. Said, get out of here. Praise the Lord. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to serve God. and I'm going to be a child of God. And when David went out there to see the battle, he knew that those giants had no business being in Palestine. God's word had already said they shouldn't be there. And that's why he felt like, boy, God's army, this is God. He didn't say this is Israel's army. This is God's army. And God's army is going to conquer them and drive them out. But they were all scared and they were afraid and they were running. And David said, that's not the way it is because in the word, we're supposed to drive them out and God has assured us that he can. And I want to tell you here today that God will give you victory over all of these things that will try to keep you from living for God and serving God and walking with the Lord. Praise the Lord. All you have to say is, Lord, I believe your word. I want to hold fast to the word of God and I'll never go back. I'll never fail you, Lord. I believe in you with all of my heart and all of my soul. And I'm just trying to tell you here today, folks, that if we'll make that determination, we'll be like David. And David said, I'll fight the giant. Finally, Saul said, okay, I guess so. If it's just a kid and he wants to go out there and get slaughtered, that's up to him. I guess he didn't care and everything. And so he said, man, David went out there, one rock hit the giant in the head. He fell. I don't know whether he was stunned, knocked him cold, killed him. I have no idea, but David didn't just stand around and wait. He went over there, took his sword, his own sword, that giant sword, and whacked his head off and held his head out for all the Philistines to see and for all of the Israelites to see that God has given us the victory. I want to tell you what, stay with the word. And this is the faith that David had. He had faith in the word of God. Praise the Lord. And God gives us faith. And so the thing I want to say to you here today, it was how David heard the word. That, that young fellow was reading the Bible and studying and reading Psalms and singing songs about, he wrote a lot of the Psalms as you well know, and, and uh, they were songs that he, and he played his harp. And they weren't just songs about, oh, I want to meet the girl, I want to see one day. It wasn't that kind of songs. It was songs about how great God was and how God had brought so much to Israel. And, and so much of the Psalms is all about that. Praise the Lord. There were songs that he wrote. 
And he loved God and he had, he read the word, he read the word, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, he said. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. He wrote those things. That's the, this comes from the 119th Psalm. I'm just trying to point out to you here that David learned the power of the word of God in his life and he held fast to it and God never failed him in it. Praise the Lord. I'm just pointing out to you here that God is faithful in all these things and he will never fail us. I want to show you something else. Nehemiah, this is another example of man of faith. I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter one with me. Nehemiah chapter one. Praise God. This is, uh, this is when Israel had been conquered by the Babylonians. And they'd been taken to Babylon. There had been a, a, big, a big conquest of them. They'd been taken to Babylon. And uh, Daniel was one of them. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, three Hebrew children, and so forth. They had all been taken. In the time, they had all passed away. They had all died, gone on. A handful of people from Israel had gone back. I say a handful. It was 50,000 to start with. They went back to Palestine to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city. And Nehemiah came along later. He was of these Jews that never went back. And he had a very significant place. In time, the, Rome, the, the uh, media, media Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians. And he was now in the media Persian Empire. And this man, Nehemiah, was a cupbearer to the king. The king of that old then known world. And a cupbearer was the guy who would sample the food, what he drank. And when somebody brought food, he'd taste the food. And if it was poison, he would die instead of the king. Then he'd give it to the king. If it was wine or any kind of a drink, he would always take it first and he would sample it and then give it to the king. So he had a very important place and he stood by the king all the time. And he and the king had become sort of good friends. And he was a Jewish guy. Look what happened here in Nehemiah chapter one. Uh, he had some men that came from Israel there, some of his friends, and he said, oh, so good to see you guys come back from Palestine. I'm so glad to see you came back from Jerusalem and the temple and the city. Oh, it's so good to see you. How is everything going? Man, is the power of God falling and God blessing and the place growing, everything? And they said, no. They said, Nehemiah is in bad shape, bad shape. They said, the people have quit working. They just, everybody's just laid off. They said, the walls are all falling all down. And the houses are still burnt. The walls still burned. And uh, everything is in terrible shape. And they described it to him. And look at verse 3. I'm going to pick it up at verse 3. They said, and they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, verse four, when I heard these words, now notice here what he heard. Are you with me? What he heard, how you hear. Now, Nehemiah could have said, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. I'm glad I'm here, not over there. But that's not how he heard the word. When he heard the word, these words that I, that I sat down and wept because he had a burden for the people of God and the things of God, and he loved God. Are you with me? It's how he heard the word. See, he could have just said, oh, really? That's too bad. Well, I'm sorry to hear about it. Well, you guys take care of us, you know, and just say, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm not over there. You know, I'm here right here by then. I'm a king cupbearer, and I got it made in the shade over here. No, 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 no. No, no. He said, I sat down, and I wept, and I mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And it goes on to talk about how he prayed, the things that he said, the things that he did. And goes on and finally down in verse 11. I'm going to go to verse 11 here just to wrap uh, this verse up right here. Look at verse 11. 
And he was finishing up his prayer. Oh, Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attended to the prayer of thy servant. He's still praying now to God. And to the prayers of thy servants, servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this, thy, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. This man referring to the king that he's a cupbearer to. And then the next, very next line, very next sentence in that last verse of that chapter one, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, uh, without going into detail, when you go to chapter two, he's now going before the king and he's doing his job. And the king says, Nehemiah, what's, what's wrong with you? You're not acting right. And he said, well, king, I don't want to burden you with my problems. But he said, I heard word about this and about that and everything. And he says, uh, my city is burned down and all that. And he explains and tells all of that to the king. And the queen's sitting by his side. And he goes on verse 3, he talks about verse, chapter 2, verse 3, he talks about it. The city is all burned. He talks about how it is. Verse 5. This is 2-5 now. I've got it right here. And I said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. And Nehemiah said, what I've heard has caused me to say, I want to do something for God. And I want to build back Jerusalem because it's still not where it should be, where it's supposed to be. And the king said to him, Nehemiah, go. Not only go, I'm going to send you. And when I send you, I'm going to send money. I'm going to send supplies. I'm going to send whatever it takes for you to do the job that you want to do when you go back there. Because I think that much of you. And he went back. Praise the Lord. Now, folks, when we hear of what the work of God needs to be done, let's not be indifferent to those things. There are still people to be saved. There are still people that we need to make contact with. Have you been praying for somebody and asking God to let you be a witness to them that you might testify to them? Have you, have you been praying to God like that? Because there are people out there that need to be saved and need to come to the Lord. There is the work of God at hand. Praise the Lord. There's all kinds. We were, we were just had this last Sunday when we went over to the church here. We saw all of these different departments of the store. I think that's wonderful. All of these different activities. Nobody has to just say, oh, I'm just going to do nothing. But we can be involved in something. Praise the Lord. Helping the kingdom of God. Helping the work of God. Praise the Lord. And that's why the church keeps on growing. That's why the missionary works keeps on growing. That's why your pastor has the burden that he has to see the great works. Praise the Lord here in America that's happening in some of our countries overseas. And he wants to see them happen more in more places overseas. Praise the Lord. God give us that feel for that. Praise the Lord. We're not content just to say, oh, I'm just going to be here and just take it easy and relax and Take, no, sir, I want to be on the front lines doing the work of God. And this was Nehemiah. So how did what he hear affect him? He said, I want to be there doing the work of God. And I'm going to be carrying the, the word of God out there. God bless you folks that work for the Lord in all kinds of ways and different ways. Some of you people are just prayer warriors. You know, that's your strength. I know, I know who you, some of you are. You're really prayer warriors. God bless you for that. Amen. And you spend time in prayer and you pray and others may not have that much time or that gift or that connection with God as you do, but you are a praying person. Some of you are musicians. You have music talents and gifts and you give those to the Lord. Thank God, whatever our gifts are. Some of you can just talk to people. You're able to talk and commune with them and to help them to understand the truth and the doctrine and the word of God. Praise the Lord. So God is with us and he will help us in all those things. And this is what Nehemiah saw as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to move on here. Nehemiah, amen, saw what the need was and he began to do it. And uh, God moved upon him. Now, 
Here is an example of the lack of faith. Now, I gave you two examples here of faith, one David, one Nehemiah. And both of these men, David nor Nehemiah, neither one of them, listen to me closely, neither one of them God spoke to and said, do it. Are you listening to me? Neither one of them had a direct command from God to go and do what they did. They saw it, they had a burden for it, and they did it. Think about that. And this is the thing that I saw with David one day about him. Nobody told David to go kill Goliath. I show you all kinds of scriptures where the Lord spoke to someone and said, go do this, go do that. I got all kinds of uh, judges and prophets in the Old Testament. The Lord spoke to them and said, do this, do this, I'll be with you. Nobody told David. He did it, praise the Lord, because he had a burden for the things of the Lord and he did what he saw needed to be done. The same thing with Nehemiah. Praise the Lord. They did it because there was a need there and nobody told Nehemiah to go back and build the tower, the walls. Nobody told him to do that. But he had a burden for it. Oh God, give us a burden, Lord. Give us a burden for the work of God. Give us a burden for the kingdom of God. All this world with all of its mess and all of its garbage out there. God, give us a burden for people that are lost, that need to find God, that need to come to the Lord, that I want to see them saved. We'll invite them to church. Bring them to church. Praise the Lord. And just do everything we can to help everybody we can find God and be in the house of the Lord. Amen. So nobody had to tell them. They just saw the burden and they did it. Now, I want to talk to you about examples of the lack of faith. And I'm going to talk to you about the 12 spies of Israel. I want you to look with me, if you would, in Numbers 13, 1. Numbers 13, 1. Praise God. I know my time's getting away, and I'm going to do this very quickly here. And uh, this is when the children of Israel had been in the wilderness for two years. They had the tabernacle. They had the, the tabernacle built. They had commandments that God had given them, not just the 10, but there's actually, uh, I think it's 613 or 14 commandments. 613, I think is the right number. And 613 commandments from God, God had given them what they should do. What they, and God said, okay, now go and take the land. They came to a place called Kadesh Barnea. And the Lord, it was in southern Judea, southern Israel. And the Lord said, all right. He said, now I'm going to send you up there. Look at the 17th verse here of Numbers chapter 13. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. Now, the Lord told him, says, I want you to know that I promised you that I'd give you the land of milk and honey. And I want you to send your, these one man from each tribe, 12 spies, they call them spies, go into the land of Canaan, go up there and spy out the land and see everything that I've told you if it isn't true, just like I told you it would be. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is. And the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. Excuse me. <coughs> and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. Verse 25. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel. Now they're going to come there and bring their report back. Verse 27. Here's what they said. They told him and said, we came unto the land, whether thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, just like the Lord said it was. And this is the fruit of it. They also brought back fruit of it. Nevertheless, we got a problem here. The people be strong that dwell in the land and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Anak was the giants. That was who Goliath was actually from, a tribe of giant people. They were like 10 feet tall people back then. Verse 29, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell in the sea, by the sea and by the coast of Judah. And Caleb still the people, Caleb now, he was a, one of the 
tribe, one of the men that went. He still the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. That was the good report that he brought. But look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, we will be not be able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we and they brought up an evil report. Now I'm telling you all of that to show you that they heard, they saw, but they did not have any faith in their heart to believe the word of God. They, we just can't do it. It's, it's, it's just impossible. Now this is showing you how the, the coins turned over where, where David and Nehemiah said they heard, we can do this. Uh, these men said, oh, we can't do it. Look at verse 14 and one. Now all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night and the children of Israel mourned against, Mo murmured against Moses and against Aaron. This is verse two. And the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness. And it went on and complained about it and everything. And then they said, let us get together a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. That's some of us talk about. They've been two years down in the wilderness. God was ready for them to go in and take the land and, and take and possess what God had promised. Folks, praise the Lord. God has promised us a lot of things. Let's keep on believing God for it. God is faithful. God will never fail. Stay with the book. Stay with the word. You hear all kinds of stories and junk out there and somebody says, oh, this is going to have bull, that's going to have bull. No, 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 no. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to serve the Lord. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. Praise God. And I want you to know that the Lord is coming back. And I got a scripture in Isaiah there and also it's found in John 12. It's the same verse of scripture. If I can read that one very quickly here. Uh, in Isaiah. Let me get there very quick. Isaiah 53, 1, the book of the chapter of 53 in Isaiah is a, is a prophecy of the crucifixion of Jesus. Very interesting chapter. This is what the first verse says. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who hath believed our report? Will you believe the report? Praise the Lord. And then that is, and of course there's a song, uh, who, you know, about uh, who will believe the report of the Lord? And then uh, John repeats that over here in the 12th chapter in the 37th verse and the 38th verse. I've got this right here. We're closing this out now. 12, 37, 38. And he says, but though he be gone, though, I'm sorry, but though he, speaking of Jesus Christ, had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Think about it. Jesus did so many miracles, but they didn't believe he was the Messiah. That the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed, who, uh, who hath re believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And it says, like, and so this is the question, you know, do we believe the word of God? Now, I'm going to leave one more thought. I'm going to close out here, and this is in John 14, 1 and 3. If you'll turn to these two verses here, I'm going to finish out. 14, 1 through 3. Jesus speaking here. And if you got your Bibles and put a ring around this section of your Bible, 1, 2, and 3. Let not your heart be troubled, verse 1. 14, 1. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. The Lord has said he's coming back, folks, and he will. Now, one other verse I want to tack on with that is the one that's found in the book of Acts. And this is when Jesus had led them across the Kidron Valley over into the Mount of Olives. And while he was talking to them, verse 9, 1, 9 of Acts. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Jesus went up. 
taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, they were still looking and he went up and up until they could not see him anymore. While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Everybody say with me, angels. angels. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus said, I'm coming back. The angel says, you saw him go up, he's going to come back. Folks, he's coming back. I believe that. I hold fast to it. I'm not going to fail him. I'm going to keep walking with him. I'm going to keep working in this kingdom of God on earth until he comes back. Praise God. And the Bible, we have this in communion. The Bible says in that, uh, that 15th chapter, 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians about communion, and it, it says, do this till I come. Do this till I come. Praise the Lord. We receive communion tonight and we do it until he comes. Let's keep on believing God for all things. For one day he will come. And when he does, praise the Lord, this old body will be changed and made into a glorified body like us and his glorified body. Let's stand together and give God the praise. How do you hear the word? Praise God. What do you hear? How do you hear it? Lord, we love you, Lord, tonight. We thank you for truth. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for communion, Lord. We thank you for your people. We thank you for the, your love to us, God. We thank you, Lord, that you understand everything we're going through and every trial, every test, every difficulty and problem. God, and we give you the praise and glory. Jesus, we'll be faithful to you till you come. We glorify your name in Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And everybody said praise the Lord.